Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to Collider Mailbag, the all mailbag show here on Collider Video, where all we do is take your mailbag questions. My name is John Campia. I am the senior producer here at Collider Video. And uh, welcome on this final day of the Thanksgiving weekend. I hope you guys had a wonderful and uh, just fantastic Thanksgiving holidays with your family and friends. And this is a show here on Collider Video where all we do, obviously, is take your mailbag questions. How do you get your question on the show? Simple. You email us at collidervideo at gmail.com. Now, every day, Monday through Friday on Movie Talk, we take one or two of your questions. And obviously, here on the weekend, we take a whole ton of your questions. So let's not waste any time. Let's get right into it. And the first question today comes to us from Ethan Lee, who writes, Hey, guys, love the show. Well, thank you so much, Ethan. My question is, what is the Oscar chances for Creed? Thanks, and keep up the great work. Uh, thanks a lot for the question, Ethan. I got to tell you, Creed is different because now the movie's out and we've had a chance to see it. One of the questions that drives me most nuts that we get all the time on Collider Video, whether it's for movie talk or mailbag or whatever, is for a movie that hasn't even come out yet and nobody's seen, hasn't come out yet, nobody's seen. And people say, do you think this movie has a chance for Oscars? Like whether we're talking, like a movie that's coming out, do you think this movie will get you? My answer is always the same. Yes. Any movie that comes out has a chance for Oscars. How good are the chances? Won't know until we see it. Uh, now, there are, there are a few expectations. Like, I'm picking Leo, I picked Leonardo DiCaprio to win the Best Actor Oscar this year, even before I saw Revenant. But obviously, there's a little bit of facetious uh, behavior there because I haven't seen the film, don't know. Um, but, you know, so a lot of people ask me, do you think, what are the Oscar chances for The Force Awakens? I have no idea. I haven't seen the movie. I, I can't even begin to guess what the Oscar chances are. But Creed is a different story because that movie is out and we have had a chance to see it. Um, and I'm going to tell you right now, I believe winning any Oscars is, that's hard. Uh, Ryan Coogler is, I believe right now, I would give a nomination out of the five spots, I would give a best a best director nomination to Ryan Coogler. When you look at the franchise, this Rocky franchise, and like I know a lot of people are like, look, look, Creed is part of the Rocky franchise. It just is, okay? Whatever semantics you want to throw into it, Creed is a part of the Rocky franchise. Anyway, um, when you look at the, the nature of films that the Rocky franchise has been, especially in, in recent years, what Coogler has done with this movie Creed is nothing short of outstanding. Um, it really is. And what he was able to do with uh, Sylvester Stallone and what he was able to do with Michael B. Jordan, an actor, by the way, which he has worked with before in Fruitvale Station. Um, it's just incredible what he did. And so I, right now, personally, I would give one of the director nominees to Coogler. We still got a bunch of films to see before the end of the year that may change that. But right now, I'm, I'm giving a nomination to Coogler. Shock and surprise, I'm giving a nomination to Sylvester Stallone for Best Supporting Actor. Who would have thought that, like, whatever it is, 35, 38, almost 40 years after he first played this character, Rocky, we're talking almost 40 years later, him getting a nomination for playing the character again. Crazy. Um, I think screenplay you have to look at as a possibility and definitely have to look at for best picture. Creed isn't going to end up in my top three. Um, I'm not even sure it's going to end up in my top four or my top five. But now that we live in a world where more than five pictures can get nominated for best picture, I think Creed deserves one of those nominations. If if there are six, seven, eight, or nine nominations for Best Picture this year, I believe Creed deserves one of those nominations. I was really impressed by this film. I, It was so much better than I thought. And you know, when Balboa came out, the last Rocky film, I thought, this is the way you end this franchise. This movie was a perfect ending for this franchise. Much better than Rocky V was. This was the movie, and it was. Balboa was a terrific movie. But this... Man, this is such a special little film. Um, I really enjoy it. If you haven't seen it, go out and check it out. So I, as of right now, I think having seen the film, I think there's a really good chance you're going to see several nominations, particularly director, supporting actor, screenplay, best picture. Um, and we'll see about Michael B. Jordan. I... I may, if you've heard me talk in Movie Talk before, I'm a massive Michael B. Jordan fan. I think an argument could have been made he should have gotten a nomination for Fruitvale Station. I think he's just good whether you put him in drama or comedy or whatever. 
Um, and he was very good in Creed. I thought he was very good in Creed. I don't know that I would give him a nomination for Best Actor. Maybe. Um, but you could certainly make an argument for it. I just don't know that he would be on my particular list for that. But a strong, strong performance. Look, Creed doesn't work unless Michael B. Jordan gives a real strong performance. To act opposite of this powerhouse performance uh, of Rocky that Sylvester Stallone gave. And he did. He did a really good job. I just don't know if I put that in there yet. We'll see. All right. Let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Troy Wentworth, who writes... My question is, don't you think that studios are now relying too much on reboots rather than creating new stories? I understand that reboots for them is a huge money-making machine due to the success of old content, but there will come a time when people will be sick of watching the same story being told over and over again, or slightly modified for a new generation. Thanks for your thoughts. Um, thanks a lot, Troy. No, I, I honestly, I don't think they're making too many reboots. I don't. Um, look... In November alone, okay, just this November, 50 films have been released. In November alone, now some very, very small release, some very, very wide release, but 50 motion pictures have been released in the month of November, okay? Uh, I think 53 or 54, whatever. Out of those 50, you know how many were reboots? None, none. Um, so do I think there are too many reboots? No. Now, some people will then want to expand that conversation to include sequels or whatever. Again, out of the 50, how many were sequels? Uh, I think three, three or four out of the 50 that got released. So do I think there's too many of those? No. Um, so no, I think it feels like there's, and look, some people will say rightly, you've heard me say this many times. Some people will rightly say there are more reboots and sequels today than there have ever been in the history of Hollywood. And that is true. However, there are also more original films being made today than in the history of Hollywood because in, by and large, there are more films being produced today than ever before in history. So that means there are more original films, there are more sequels, and there are more reboots. There's more, th there's everything. There's more of it in history than there has ever been in the history of Hollywood. Now, the responsibility of Hollywood and studios and whatever is to make money because they're a business. So you, you, and you hope the better the movie you make, the more money you will make. So um, when they have done this over years and years and years and they see, hey, the movies that have recognizable names, recognizable titles, those, they tend to do well then it behooves them to make those sequels and to make those, because we as the audience, we vote with our dollars and we pay to go see those movies more than we go to see the others. Like it still astounds me that the best movie from last year, Birdman, uh, also happened to win Best Picture, but I, I personally think it was the best movie of the year. That Birdman only made $42 million at the North America, in, in North America. It only made $42 million. It was a incredibly powerful and outrageously original film as far as you can be original these days. And yet, uh, only a moderate amount of people want to go see it. And then we sit back and we go, gosh, why are they making another Transformers movie? Because it made a billion dollars. Because people went to go see it. So, I mean, I still contend there are more original films to be made today than any other time in history. But we got to vote with our dollars as to which ones get the wider release. So when a, a good original one comes out, we support it, we go and see it, and whatever. Spotlight hasn't gotten a wide release yet, but I'm going to guarantee you Spotlight isn't going to do bank uh, blockbuster numbers. It's not. It's a great movie. One of the best of the year. It's going to get nominated for Best Picture, and it deserves it. But most of you guys won't go see it. And then we'll wonder and cry and complain. Well, why don't more original films go wide release? Because they do put them out and nobody supports them. I mean, that's, and then we will always try to blame the studio. Somehow, no, well, uh, if people didn't go to see it, then that's because the studios, no, 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 no. Studios did their jobs. They make original films. They make good original films. And, but, but we keep telling them we're not interested. We're not interested. Birdman comes out, $42 million. Give me a break. Give me a break. They go, you're wrong. I love me some Fast and Furious. I loved me some Fast and Furious, this last one. I did. Really, really enjoyed it. 
But we're talking about a world right now where over a, where Fast and Furious makes over a billion dollars, but Birdman makes 42 million in North America. Worldwide, I think maybe it cracked 100 million. Maybe. Um, so that's the, the reality we live in. So if we want to ask the question continuously, why do, why do uh, studios make reboots? Why do studios make things? Even though they're making tons and tons of original content, why are they making them? Because we as the audience say that's what we want. How do we tell them that's what we want? That's what we buy the tickets for. It's just that simple. Now, as far as the, the notion of, you know, eventually people are going to get sick of the same story being told over and over again. No, we're not. No, we're not. We're, look, there is no more, there's no more truly original stories to tell. All of human existence right now and all the stories we live, uh, even, or the stories that we tell are, are modifications and slight variants on stories that have come before. You know, Avatar, that was an original movie. But it was clearly just a ripoff of Fern Gully and Dances with Wolves, particularly Dances with Wolves. It is a story we saw before, completely, note for note, we saw it before. But it was an original film. Um, you know, the original Fast and the Furious film is just a complete plot point by plot point ripoff of Point Break. It's just a complete plot point by plot point ripoff of Point Break. But it's an original film. Um... Even Memento, when it came out, it's like, oh my gosh, the most original film ever. And then a whole bunch of people came in. No, if you look, it's it's the same as this movie from 1963 and is the same thing as this movie from... I mean, all stories are stories that have been told, elements thereof. And we're slightly variations and hopefully a new way of telling the story. Storytelling is not about telling about situations or contexts that have never been thought up before. It's about telling the stories well and telling them in a compelling way. And if that means an, an original film that just uses tools that have been passed down through storytelling for generations, or whether it's telling a reboot or a sequel that uses tools passed down through generations but with a similar title, then it's all the same to me. And you know, the, the concept of reboot, I have still, to this day, with all the debates I've had on movie talk with, with my fellow panelists, some of whom are much smarter than me, some of them are not. Anyway, uh, I'll let you decide who's who. But uh, in all the debates I've had with my fellow panelists on, on movie talk over the years about reboots, um, I have yet to hear one legitimate argument against reboots. Um, the, normally what people go to is, it doesn't need a reboot. That's not a reason. No movie needs to be made. None. It doesn't need a reboot. That's not a reason. That's not a reason. They didn't need to reboot The Fly, but they did, and it was an incredible success. They didn't need to make The Night Before, but they did, and it's a fantastic comedy. They didn't, Pixar didn't need to make The Good Dinosaur, but they did. It's going to make money, and it's a really nice, charming film. So they didn't need to make it. They don't need to make it. It's not, it's not a valid reason. No movie needs to get made. Hell, even Star Wars The Force Awakens didn't need to get made. I'm just really damn glad it did. But it didn't need to. Um, and, and some people say, well, oh, it can't be as good as the original. So what? What movie is going to come out next week that's as good as The Godfather? None. No movie is coming out next week that is as good as The Godfather. But that's not a reason to not put out a movie. Why make a movie? It won't be as good as The Godfather. Okay, yeah, but you can still make a great, awesome movie. Don't go, don't go comparing it to that. Just because it's not going to be this doesn't mean it's not worth making a movie. Just because you're going to make a movie that's not a perfect 10 out of 10 does not mean it's not a, a, a movie worth being made. Man, I love 7 out of 10 movies. Love them. I want them. So this whole notion of you can't make it as good as the original invalid excuse totally invalid excuse okay because let's take the godfather for example real extreme example you want to remake the godfather okay you want to remake it fine now let's say they remake the godfather and give us like one of the 10 best movies of the year like it's an eight and a half out of ten are we going to say yeah but they shouldn't made it because it couldn't be as good as the original so what they gave us an eight out of ten movie so this notion of they don't need to make it invalid totally invalid argument never use that argument please the argument is you can't make it as good as the original invalid totally invalid argument because lots of movies get made that will never live up to other movies but that doesn't mean they're not worth being made and they're not still awesome movies 
Um, so, so don't even go there. Just don't, don't go there. Um, some people then try to say, well, it will ruin the original. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Look, I give, I've given this example a lot of times. Um, uh, North, they did a North American remake of Infernal Affairs, my all time favorite cop movie, Infernal Affairs. And they did a North American remake of it. Martin Scorsese did. And it's not as good as, uh, Infernal Affairs, The Departed. That's that's the name of uh, the Scorsese, Leo DiCaprio, uh, Matt Damon, uh, Mark Wahlberg, Alec Baldwin, on and on and on. A great cast. Awesome movie. I love the movie. Won the Oscar for Best Picture of the Year, The Departed did. Still not as good as the original. Are you going to tell me The Departed wasn't worth making because it couldn't be as good as the original? No, it was awesome. And we're all so glad they made it because it's an awesome movie. Was it as good as, Inf as Infernal Affairs? No, but who cares? It's an awesome movie. Now we have another awesome movie on our shelves. But let's say it just turned out horrible. Guess what? Um, uh, what was the one they just did? Total Recall, right? With Colin Farrell, based on the Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. It's funny, but I haven't talked to anybody since the Total Recall reboot came out that loves the original Arnold movie that just says to me now, and now suddenly, I don't know why, but magically, now I don't like the original Arnold movie. Hasn't happened. Hasn't happened once. All right? People saw Total Recall. They didn't like it. I actually kind of did like it. Not so. I didn't think it was all that bad. But the majority of people did not like it. They thought it was a bad film. And then I can't argue against it. There's many bad things about that movie. Anyway, Total Recall comes out. It's a bad film. Guess what? Have people forgotten about the Arnold Schwarzenegger Total Recall? No, but what did happen? And this is fact. Look it up. Interest in the original Total Recall, the one with Arnold Schwarzenegger, spiked when a reboot got made. More people who had never seen the original Arnold Schwarzenegger Total Recall ended up seeking it out and renting it or streaming it or buying it because interest in the title had been raised because the Colin Farrell reboot came out. More people got to see and appreciate the original because the reboot came out. Do you know how many people who had never seen Infernal Affairs saw Infernal Affairs because The Departed came out? And we see this time and time again. When a reboot comes out, even if it's bad, when a reboot comes out of a good original film, interest in that original film spikes. Look it up interest in those original films. So you see nothing but good things happen when a reboot gets made, even if it's a reboot of, uh, of a beloved classic, because more people are then driven to go and see the original. Even if the reboot ends up being terrible, you put out a bad reboot to a classic. Guess what? The DVDs of the classics don't suddenly get blurry and out of focus. They don't suddenly lose 45 minutes off the end. They're still there. They're still classic. They're still there to be loved. But reboots drive more attention to them and drive more interest in them. And guess what? Now today, more people have seen the original Arnold Schwarzenegger Total Recall. More people have seen the original Infernal Affairs. More people have seen the original whatever movie you want to mention because the reboot got made. So again, I have yet to hear one valid reason why reboots shouldn't get made. If they think they can take a shot at it and they have a shot at it being a good movie and they have a shot at making money, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work, but that's the same with original films as well. But here's the thing too, this part drives me a little bit crazy. I find almost a lot of people who will cry at me, and I'm not, you're not crying, but a lot of people on Twitter or whatever cry at me, oh, too many reboots, too many reboots. But then you mention, hey, um, um, you over there in the corner saying there are too many reboots, too many reboots. What do you think Fox should do with uh, with Fantastic Four? They should give it back to Marvel so Marvel can reboot it. Yay! Well, you Weren't you just saying you don't want too many reboots? Yeah, but it's Fantastic Four. I mean, a lot of people who will whine and complain about there are too many reboots, too many reboots. Hey, uh, what, what do you think about, uh, what do you think Sony should do with uh, Spider-Man? Let it go back to Marvel so Marvel can reboot it. Yay! Uh, hey, you over there in that corner, you saying, complaining there are too many reboots. Um, uh, weren't you just saying that Marvel should make another standalone Hulk movie? Yeah, reboot that again or make a sequel and so glad they did from the Ang Lee. Yeah, yay, reboots. I mean, so there's a little bit of hypocrisy there 
There's a little bit of hypocrisy there. I am one of those guys, though, who have no problem with reboots. Reboot anything, reboot everything, if it makes business sense. Um, and if you can you can build on something and you can fill it into a niche and you think there's a desire there in the audience to see it. If there all those things are there, go ahead and reboot it. Reboot Star Wars. Go ahead. Reboot Star Wars. I mean, they're not going to reboot it so long as they're continuing on the episodes, but let's say for whatever reason, um, The Force Awakens sucks and it kills the franchise. And after all the money it makes on opening weekend, nobody goes to see it again and it falls way short of expectations and Star and Disney kills all their Star Wars plans, okay? And instead they just say, in 2018, we're going to reboot Star Wars. We're going to reboot the original Star Wars. Guess what my opinion is going to be? That's fine with me. Go ahead, reboot it. If it's good, then I have another really good movie to put on my shelf. If it sucks, so what? I still got the originals, baby. So that's all that matters to me. So you want to reboot Star Wars? Reboot Star Wars. I mean, don't right now because you've got it going. You've got the story ongoing, so don't reboot it right now. That would be counterproductive to what you're doing. But if you kill this new franchise, go ahead and reboot Star Wars. Anyway, uh, I went on way too long on that. Let's go on to the next question. I'll fly through the next bunch here. Let's go on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Lynn, who writes, I'm a massive James Bond fan, but I have to say that MI5, Mission Impossible 5 Rogue Nation, won the Battle of the Spy movies this year. My question is, do you think the original December release date of MI5 was changed to a summer one to avoid Spectre based on financial or similar plotline reasons? How much do movie studios know about each other's films content in advance? Well, there's really two parts to that question. Number one, studios know an awful lot about their other studios content. They know an awful lot. That's their business. And they will plan their release schedules accordingly. Um, MI5 was not daunted by the prospect of releasing in the same neighborhood as a James Bond film. Remember, they weren't actually going to be releasing too close to each other. There was, there was a good number of weeks that would be in between them. So really, it wasn't that big of a deal. There are really two reasons why they moved Rogue Nation much earlier. Uh, number one, and I think this is the most predominant one, they were done the film and they thought, you know what? We believe that this film is great and we believe it will do really well in the summer season. Let's release it now. And they did. And it worked out for them quite well. Um, the second reason, if there was any film they were wanting to avoid, because they did believe this was a really good movie and Rogue Nation is a great movie, they did believe they had a really good movie on their hands that could make a lot of money if there was anything they were hoping. And, and, and Spectre was going to be finishing its box office run, so Spectre wasn't going to hurt it. They were worried about Star Wars, as everybody should be worried about Star Wars. That's what they were primarily worried about. Um, but really, I think it more had to do with the fact that they just had a great movie. They believed in it. It was done. It was ready to go. And they believed it could thrive in a summer season environment. And that's what they did. And it was the right move. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes from Jack Deal, who writes, Hello, everyone at Collider. My question is about Darth Maul. I just finished reading the Sons of Dathomir comics, and Darth Maul's future seems to be left purposely open for future stories. Is there a chance that we will ever see slash read a final closing to Maul's storyline? And if so, where would you like it to be? My first thought was Star Wars Rebels, but I am not sure if Maul's aggressive and violent nature is right for that show. Maybe he will show up in a book or a comic about Obi-Wan. My top pick would be an anthology movie that pits him against Kenobi. What are your thoughts about Maul's future and where do you want to think or slash think he will show up if anywhere? Well, thanks a lot for the question, Jack. Now, for those of you who don't know what Jack is talking about, you think, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Darth Maul from The Phantom Menace, he died. He was cut in half and fell down a massive pit. I mean, you fall down that massive of a pit normally you're going to die when you hit the ground. He was cut in half first and then thrown in. He's dead. Yeah, well, Rebels, not Rebels, um, the animated show Star Wars, uh, The Clone Wars, um, did something kind of stupid and they brought him back. Now, I will say this. I was not a fan of the Star Wars Clone Wars show. I'm a big fan of Rebels, but I'm, I wasn't a fan of the Clone Wars show. But the episodes that focused on Darth Maul and his uh, brother, Savage, um, 
were actually the, probably the best ones. They were really good. They were really good. It doesn't take away from the fact that it was such a stretch for them to say Darth Maul somehow survived that fall, comes back in this big spider body, and then gets robotic legs, whatever. Um, whether they should or should not have brought Darth Maul back is kind of moot, though, because they did bring him back, and they did some pretty cool things with him when they did bring him back. I think, I tend to agree with um, my cohort Christian Harloff on this. I think if you're going to bring Darth Maul back right now, I believe the best place for him is an Obi-Wan Kenobi anthology movie. I believe you have an Obi-Wan movie with Ewan McGregor back playing Obi-Wan, now living on Tatooine. Maybe it's 10 years after the events of, uh, of Revenge of the Sith. And you have now Darth Maul, who's back, out hunting him. And you make an Obi-Wan anthology movie with Darth Maul to settle the score. I think that's your best bet. And I don't think he's too dark for Rebels. They have, they've done some dark things on Rebels. So I believe that you could use Darth Maul there. But I, I think the better use for him, if you're going to use him at all, would be an Obi-Wan anthology movie. By the way, that's really the only way I'm interested in an Obi-Wan anthology movie, too, is if you have Darth Maul there. So you do an Obi-Wan movie with Darth Maul, live action, Ewan McGregor. Uh, you bring Park back to play uh, Maul. Then, uh, then I think you got something that could be kind of interesting. All right, thanks a lot for the question. Let's move on to the next one. And the next question today comes to us from Ray Doyle. And Ray Doyle writes, Catching up on the new Disney canon with your recommendations of Lords of the Sith and Tarkin, as well as finishing the Clone Wars. My question is regarding Shadows of the Empire. When this book was released, it had a multimedia campaign, including a soundtrack and video game. I haven't seen anywhere if it has been discarded from the canon and if any stories that have been released take over Shadow's Place between episodes five and six. Thanks, guys, and love the show. I can tell you right now, Ray, this comes up a lot as we get closer to Star Wars. A lot of questions about what is canon, what is not. Shadows of the Empire is not canon. It is discarded. It was never actually canon. Shadows of the Empire was never canon. So when Disney took over, and you've heard me say this a lot, but since the question keeps coming up, um, when Disney took over Star Wars and Lucasfilm, they put out a thing. It was like, it was the culling day for the expanded universe. They said only the movies, Clone Wars, and the new one, Rebels, only the movies, plus those couple of things, are canon. Nothing else is, everything else is now what they put a label on called Legends. Basically, it's fan fiction. Which means they killed my all-time favorite Star Wars story, the uh, Grand Admiral Thrawn trilogy with Heir to the Empire. They killed that. It's not real. It doesn't exist. Uh, all the Rogue Squadron stuff, not real. Doesn't exist. All the Jedi Academy stuff, not real. Doesn't exist. And all the Shadows of the Empire, not real. Does not exist. Now, that does not mean, though, that the current crop of... Uh, Star Wars creative forces like uh, Dave Fioni and J.J. Uh, Abrams and all these people, they are free to go to all of that discarded stuff and take elements and bring them into canon if they so choose. We've already seen that happen on a couple of small instances. But as, as far as the grander question goes, no. Uh, Shadows of the Empire is officially labeled as Legends. It is not canon and it is gone. So, But who knows? Maybe they might cherry pick a couple of elements from Shadows of the Empire and bring them into the canon at some point. All right. Thanks a lot for the question. Next question comes to us from Marcel Pillay who writes, Do you think we will see Marvel uh, to develop the relationship between Vision and Scarlet Witch? Also, do you think they will put them on opposite sides? Okay, see, this is a question that's been coming up ever since Age of Ultron. Um, you see, in the comics, there have been romance between, not a bit, there's, there's a romance between Vision and Scarlet Witch. And in Age of Ultron, you see in the, uh, the picture right here, they even had a moment where Vision scoops up Scarlet Witch and they kind of share a look. I believe that little look they did was a little wink from um, uh, Joss Whedon to the fans of the comic books who know that story. But, look, Vision is, uh, technically he's an android. He's a machine, he's a robot. 
it's it's interesting to explore that relationship. If, for any of you who watch Star Trek The Next Generation, remember Data had a relationship with the, uh, oh, the, the female character on the show who was the chief of security before Worf, and then she died in like season two or three. I can't remember the, the character's name, but they Data had a romantic sexual relationship, even though he's an android, with one of the female cast members. And that made a lot of people go, mm, I don't know if I'm comfortable with that. I it would it would be an interesting, if not slightly risky, move on Disney and Marvel's part to introduce a full-blown romance between an android and a uh, Scarlet Witch. But that doesn't mean they won't do it. Okay, personally, I don't think they will. I think it'd be I'd be really fascinated if they did, though, to see how they handled that. Personally, I don't think they will. As to which side Vision is going to fall on, I mean, there have been, I don't know. I, I mean, I don't know if they will be on opposite sides. We'll have to wait and see. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Harrison S. who writes, I've been a fan of the show for the past few months and I never miss an episode. Well, thank you so much, Harrison. My question is regards to romantic comedies. Lately, I just rewatched Coming to America and then it hit me. This is technically a romantic comedy, or at least I think it is. However, most people see it as a comedy only. What are your thoughts? Great question, actually. You know, it's funny because uh, it was just Halloween recently, and Christian Harloff came in dressed as Sexual Chocolate, the band from Coming to America, which I thought was really funny. Coming to America is hilarious. I love that movie. But you raise a good point. You know, I'll be honest with you. I have only ever thought of Coming to America as a comedy. I've never thought of it as a romantic comedy until you sent that email. And when I stop and think about it, it really is. His, Eddie Murphy, the prince's desire to stay in America and really the, the impetus for everything he's doing is that he loves this woman. It re- And then it brings their, both their families into it, but it is, I think by definition, Coming to America is a romantic comedy. I've never thought of it in those terms before, but now that I think about it, it really it fits all the the check boxes you have to check off to say this is what would make it a romantic comedy. And when you sit down and look at those, and you go, yeah, you know what? The, coming to America is a romantic comedy. I'm on board with you. I agree with you. I think Coming to America is a romantic comedy. What do you guys think? Jump in the comment section. Is Coming to America a romantic comedy? Yes. Why? No. Why not? Let us know. All right. And now we're on to the final question of the day. And the final question today comes to us from Mike Gullick, who writes, my question is regarding our initial impressions of The Force Awakens. Given how masterfully the movie is being marketed and how high our enthusiasm uh, for it is, are you at all worried uh, that us fans might give the film a much more positive initial reaction than it really deserves? I know John has mentioned often how he gave the prequels high ratings at first and upon deeper communion with the force, did he realize the error of his ways? I want so badly for this film to be great uh, that I'm afraid I might say it's really awesome when I might, when it might only be mediocre or worse. Well, thanks a lot for the question, Mike. And what Mike's referring to here is, and I've told this story hundreds of times, but I mean, I back 15 years, 20 years ago, whenever the Phantom Menace came out, I drank the Kool-Aid. I drank it hard. Because not only Phantom Menace, but all the prequels. I mean, when those movies came, I gave them positive reviews. And then as I watched them more and the the effects of the Kool-Aid wore off, I started to realize, oh God, no, these movies suck. And I was in denial. I was in total denial about how bad those movies are. And they are atrocious. The question then, is that what we're all going to do when the new Force Awakens comes out? And I don't think we will. I don't think you will. I don't think I'm going to. And the reason is, is because I think we have learned the lessons of the prequels. Like, look, we almost everybody was super stoked for The Amazing Spider-Man 2. Super stoked for The Amazing Spider-Man 2. Because The Amazing Spider-Man 1 was fantastic. The trailers for The Amazing Spider-Man 2 were awesome. Like, me and Schnepp were both like, oh my god, these, this movie's gonna be, oh, freaking amazing. It's got a great cast. It's got, you know, a great director. The last one was fantastic. This is gonna be awesome, blah, 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 blah. And we walked out of it. And um, 
Schnepp hated that movie, hated it. Now, I still think there were redeeming qualities about the movie, but even I, the most positive out of anybody that I know about that movie, even I will tell you, huge step backwards, massive disappointment, and they really botched a lot of things in that movie. Now, I thought there were redeeming qualities about it. To this day, I still think there were redeeming qualities about it. But, you know, despite the fact that our hopes were so high and we're so ramped, we are now all people, you, me, all of us, we are now people who live through the lessons of the prequels. Uh, that, hey, no matter how much we want it to be good, it's either good or it's not good. Um, I, and, you know, I had a little bit of that. I think I walked out of Age of Ultron. When I walked out of Age of Ultron, the first minute, now we're not talking years, we're talking minute, literally one minute, after I walked out, I thought, man, I'm not sure if I like this one better or the original Avengers. Now, a half hour later, just 30 minutes later, I'm like, nah, this wasn't as good as the original Avengers. And then about an hour later, I was like, yeah, I, I'm not even sure it's in the top three best Marvel films. And that's where I am right now. I still think, I know a lot of people really didn't like Age of Ultron. I thought Age of Ultron was really a good film, but not in the top three best Marvel films. Not as good as Captain America Civil War. Not as good as the original Avengers. I still think it was a very good movie, though. Um, but I think we all have the capacity to walk out of a movie and having one reaction. And then once we have like a half hour, an hour to think about it, maybe we like it a little bit more. Maybe we like it a little bit less. You know, whatever. That, that all still happens. But I think the days are now gone because we've all been bitten now so many times by movies that look awesome and we're excited and then we go see it and it's a disappointment. We've all had that experience now that I think we can resist that. I hope I can resist it with Star Wars because I want to like it so bad. I really do. But, you know, I was able to resist it with the Clone Wars stuff. I wanted to love Clone Wars so much, especially that Star Wars movie, Clone Wars, that animated movie they put out. I wanted to love it so much, I walked out hating it. I really did because I'd learned my lesson. If anything, here's the thing. For me personally, maybe this is true for you too. I'm worried about myself for the opposite. I'm now a little bit worried that I am so sensitive to the lessons I learned from the prequels. I am now worried that even if it's good, I'll walk out going, that was crap. Like, I, I'm, I'm almost worried in myself of having the opposite reaction. You know what I mean? I hope not, but... I guess we'll have to see now. Fortunately, I'm going to see it with Anne. I'm going to see it with Mark and Christian. We're all going to be watching it together and, and hopefully we'll balance each other out. So, But I think the, the overall thing is I think we all as a culture, we've learned the lessons from the prequels to, to leave our expectations at the door. You know, this is lessons that it's taken me 20 years to learn, but um, leave our expectations at the door, go in and watch the movie and then come out and evaluate the movie for the movie's sake. Uh, without the hype, without the expectations, forget the trailers, forget what everybody else is saying, and just judge for it. I hope that's what we're able to do, but we won't know for sure until December 15th. Uh, I, me and Mark and Christian and Ann, we're going to go see, the, we get to go to the world premiere. We were invited to the world premiere. This is a bucket list thing for me, um, going to an actual Star Wars world premiere. I cannot wait. It's going to be awesome. Anyway, uh, that'll do it for me, guys. Thank you so much for joining us for this installment of Collider Mailbag. I hope you guys have had a wonderful Thanksgiving weekend. And again, the important thing here is not what is this idiot's uh, opinion of these topics. I'm simply here to chat and talk movies, but amongst friends. What's really important here is what did you guys think about all these questions we have? Jump into the comment section, leave your thoughts. Let's have a discussion. Be respectful of each other and, and let's have a discussion about why we agree, why we disagree, all that kind of stuff. Love to hear your thoughts. So that'll do it for me, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. Don't forget, you can find me, follow me on Facebook and Twitter, at John Campy. You can see that right here. I often give a lot of announcements, let people know what's going on with Collider Video on my social media first, so make sure you're following me there. So that'll do it for us, guys. So until tomorrow when Movie Talk will be back, bye-bye.